The July 7, 2005 London bombings, often referred to as 7 sevenths, were a series of coordinated terrorist suicide attacks in London, United Kingdom, which targeted civilians travelling on the city's public transport system during the morning rush hour. Four Islamic terrorists separately detonated three bombs in quick succession aboard London underground trains across the city and, later, a fourth on a double-decker bus in Tavistock Square. The train bombings occurred on the Circle Line near Aldgate and at Edgware Road, and on the Piccadilly Line near Russell Square. Fifty-two people, all UK residents but of 18 different nationalities, were killed and more than 700 were injured in the attacks making it Britain's deadliest terrorist incident since the 1988 bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland, as well as the country's first ever Islamic suicide attack. The explosions were caused by homemade organic peroxide-based devices packed into backpacks. The bombings were followed two weeks later by a series of attempted attacks that failed to cause injury or damage. The July 7 attacks occurred the day after London had won its bid to host the 2012 Olympic Games. Attacks London Underground At 8.49 a.m., three bombs were detonated on board London Underground trains within 50 seconds of each other. The first bomb exploded on a six-car London Underground C69 and C77 stock circle line subsurface train, number 204 traveling eastbound between Liverpool Street and Aldgate. The train had left King's Cross St Pancras about eight minutes earlier. At the time of the explosion, the train's third car was approximately 100 yards, 90 m, along the tunnel from Liverpool Street. The parallel track of the Hammersmith and City line between Liverpool Street and Aldgate East was also damaged in the blast. The second bomb exploded in the second car of another six-car London Underground C69 and C77 Stock Circle Line subsurface train, number 216, which had just left Platform 4 at Edgware Road and was travelling westbound towards Paddington. The train had left King's Cross St Pancras about eight minutes previously. There were several other trains nearby at the time of the explosion, an eastbound Circle Line train arriving at Platform 3 at Edgware Road from Paddington, was passing next to the bombed train and was damaged, as well as a wall that later collapsed. Two other trains were at Edgware Road, an unidentified train on Platform 2 and a southbound Hammersmith and City Line service that had just arrived at Platform 1. A third bomb was detonated on a six-car London Underground 1973 stock Piccadilly Line deep-level underground train, number 311, travelling southbound from King's Cross St Pancras to Russell Square. The device exploded approximately one minute after the service departed King's Cross, by which time it had travelled about 500 yards, 450 m. The explosion occurred at the rear of the first car of the train number 166 causing severe damage to the rear of that car as well as the front of the second one. The surrounding tunnel also sustained damage. It was originally thought that there had been six, rather than three, explosions on the underground network. The bus bombing brought the reported total to seven, this was clarified later in the day. The erroneous reporting can be attributed to the fact that the blasts occurred on trains that were between stations, causing wounded passengers to emerge from both stations giving the impression that there was an incident at each. Police also revised the timings of the two blasts, initial reports had indicated that they occurred during a period of almost half an hour. This was due to initial confusion at London Underground, LU, where the explosions were originally believed to have been caused by power surges. An early report, made in the minutes after the explosions, involved a person under a train, while another described a derailment, both of which did occur, but only as a result of the explosions. A code amber alert was declared by LU at 9.19, and LU began to cease the network's operations, ordering trains to continue only to the next station and suspending all services. 
The effects of the bombs are understood to have varied due to the differing characteristics of the tunnels in which they occurred. The circle line is a cut and cover subsurface tunnel, about 7 m, 21 feet, deep. As the tunnel contains two parallel tracks, it is relatively wide. The two explosions on the circle line were probably able to vent their force into the tunnel, reducing their destructive force. The Piccadilly line is a deep level tunnel, up to 30 m, 100 feet, below the surface and with narrow, 3.56 m, or 11 feet 8 1 fourth in, single track tubes and just 15 cm, 6 in, clearances. This confined space reflected the blast force, concentrating its effect. Tavistock Square Bus Almost one hour after the attacks on the London Underground, a fourth bomb was detonated on the top deck of a No. 30 double-decker bus, a Dennis Trident II, Fleet No. 17758, registration LX03 Buff, two years in service at the time, operated by Stagecoach London and travelling its route from Marble Arch to Hackney Wick. Earlier, the bus had passed through the King's Cross area as it travelled from Hackney Wick to Marble Arch. At its final destination, the bus turned around and started the return route to Hackney Wick. It left Marble Arch at 9 a.m. and arrived at Euston Bus Station at 9.35 a.m., where crowds of people had been evacuated from the tube and were boarding buses. The explosion at 9.47 a.m. in Tavistock Square ripped off the roof and destroyed the rear portion of the bus. The blast took place near BMA House, the headquarters of the British Medical Association, on Upper Woburn Place. A number of doctors and medical staff in or near that building were able to provide immediate emergency assistance. Witnesses reported seeing half a bus flying through the air. BBC Radio 5 Live and The Sun later reported that two injured bus passengers said that they saw a man exploding in the bus. The location of the bomb inside the bus meant the front of the vehicle remained mostly intact. Most of the passengers at the front of the top deck survived, as did those near the front of the lower deck, including the driver, but those at the rear of the bus suffered more serious injuries. The extent of the damage caused to the victims' bodies resulted in a lengthy delay in announcing the death toll from the bombing while the police determined how many bodies were present and whether the bomber was one of them. Several passers-by were also injured by the explosion and surrounding buildings were damaged by debris. The bombed bus was subsequently covered with tarpaulin and removed by low loader for forensic examination at a secure Ministry of Defence site. The vehicle was ultimately returned to Stagecoach and scrapped thereafter on October 15, 2009. A replacement bus, a new Alexander Dennis Enviro 400, fleet number 18500, which has been changed since to 19000, registration LX55HGC, was named Spirit of London. In October 2012, the Spirit of London bus was set alight in an arson attack. It was repaired and refurbished at a cost of £60,000 and re-entered service in April 2013. Two 14-year-old girls were charged for the attack. Victims The 52 victims were of diverse backgrounds, among them were several foreign-born British nationals and foreign exchange students. The majority of the victims lived in or near London. Because of train delays before the attacks and subsequent transport problems caused by them, several victims died aboard trains and buses they would not normally have taken. Their ages ranged from 20 to 60 years old, with an average age of 34. All of the victims were UK residents, 32 of them were British. One victim each came from Afghanistan, France, Ghana, Grenada, India, Iran, Israel, Italy, Kenya, Mauritius, New Zealand, Nigeria, Romania, Sri Lanka, and Turkey. Three victims were Polish nationals, while one victim held dual Australian-Vietnamese citizenship and one held dual American-Vietnamese citizenship. Seven of the victims were killed at Aldgate, six at Edgware Road 
26 at King's Cross and 13 at Tavistock Square. Attackers Profiles The four suicide bombers were later identified and named as Mohammed Siddiq Khan, aged 30. Khan detonated his bomb just after leaving Edgware Road Tube Station on a train traveling toward Paddington, at 8.50 a.m. He lived in Beeston, Leeds, with his wife and young child, where he worked as a learning mentor at a primary school. The blast killed seven people, including Khan himself. Shazad Tanweer, aged 22. He detonated a bomb aboard a train traveling between Liverpool Street Station and Aldgate Tube Station, at 8.50 a.m. He lived in Leeds with his mother and father, working in a fish and chip shop. Eight people, including Tanweer, were killed by the explosion. Germain Lindsay, aged 19. He detonated his device on a train traveling between King's Cross and Russell Square Tube Stations, at 8.50 a.m. He lived in Aylesbury, Buckinghamshire, with his pregnant wife and young son. His blast killed 27 people, including Lindsay himself. Hazib Hussain, the youngest of the four at 18, Hussain detonated his bomb on the top deck of a double-decker bus at 9.47 a.m. He lived in Leeds with his brother and sister-in-law. Fourteen people, including Hussain died in the explosion in Tavistock Square. Three of the bombers were British-born sons of Pakistani immigrants, Lindsay was a convert born in Jamaica. Charles Clark, Home Secretary when the attacks occurred, described the bombers as clean skins, a term describing them as previously unknown to authorities until they carried out their attacks. On the day of the attacks, all four had travelled to Luton, Bedfordshire, by car then to London by train. They were recorded on CCTV arriving at King's Cross Station at about 8.30 a.m. On July 12, 2005, the BBC reported that the Metropolitan Police Service's anti-terrorism chief deputy assistant commissioner Peter Clark said that property belonging to one of the bombers had been found at both the Aldgate and Edgware Road blasts. Videotape Statements Two of the bombers made videotapes describing their reasons for becoming what they called soldiers. In a videotape broadcast by Al Jazeera on September 1, 2005, Mohammed Siddiq Khan, described his motivation. The tape had been edited and mentioned Al-Qaeda members Osama bin Laden, Ayman al-Zawahiri and Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, describing them as today's heroes. Khan's tape said, I and thousands like me are forsaking everything for what we believe. Our drive and motivation doesn't come from tangible commodities that this world has to offer. Our religion is Islam, obedience to the one true God and following the footsteps of the final prophet messenger. Your democratically elected governments continuously perpetuate atrocities against my people all over the world. And your support of them makes you directly responsible just as I am directly responsible for protecting and avenging my Muslim brothers and sisters. Until we feel security you will be our targets and until you stop the bombing, gassing, imprisonment and torture of my people we will not stop this fight. We are at war and I am a soldier. Now you too will taste the reality of this situation. The tape continued. I myself, I myself, I make dua, pray to Allah, to raise me amongst those whom I love like the prophets, the messengers, the martyrs, and today's heroes like our beloved Sheikh Osama bin Laden, Dr. Ayman al-Zawari and Abu Musab al-Zarqawi and all the other brothers and sisters that are fighting in the, of this cause. On July 6, 2006, a videotape statement by Shazad Tanweer was broadcast by Al Jazeera. In the video, which may have been edited to include remarks by Al-Zawahiri, Tanweer said. What you have witnessed now is only the beginning of a string of attacks that will continue and become stronger until you pull your forces out of Afghanistan and Iraq. And until you stop your financial and military support to America and Israel. 
Tanweer argued that the non-Muslims of Britain deserve such attacks because they voted for a government which continues to oppress our mothers, children, brothers and sisters in Palestine, Afghanistan, Iraq and Chechnya. Effects and Response Initial Reports Initial reports suggested that a power surge on the underground power grid had caused explosions in power circuits. This was later ruled out by Power Suppliers National Grid. Commentators suggested that the explanation had been made because of bomb damage to power lines along the tracks, the rapid series of power failures caused by the explosions, or power being ended by means of switches at the locations to permit evacuation, looked similar from the point of view of a control room operator, to a cascading series of circuit breaker operations that would result from a major power surge. A couple of hours after the bombings, Home Secretary Charles Clark confirmed the incidents were terrorist attacks. Security Alerts Although there were security alerts at many locations throughout the United Kingdom, no other terrorist incidents occurred outside central London. Suspicious packages were destroyed in controlled explosions in Edinburgh, Brighton, Coventry, Southampton, Portsmouth, Darlington, and Nottingham. Security across the country was increased to the highest alert level. The Times reported on July 17, 2005 that police sniper units were following as many as a dozen Al-Qaeda suspects in Britain. The covered armed teams were ordered to shoot to kill if surveillance suggested that a terror suspect was carrying a bomb and he refused to surrender if challenged. A member of the Metropolitan Police's Specialist Firearms Command said, these units are trained to deal with any eventuality. Since the London bombs they have been deployed to look at certain people. Transport and Telecoms Disruption Vodafone reported that its mobile telephone network reached capacity at about 10 a.m. on the day of the bombings, and it was forced to initiate emergency procedures to prioritize emergency calls, a CULC, the Access Overload Control. Other mobile phone networks also reported failures. The BBC speculated that the telephone system was shut down by security services to prevent the possibility of mobile phones being used to trigger bombs. Although this option was considered, it became clear later that the intermittent unavailability of both mobile and landline telephone systems was due only to excessive usage. A CULC was activated only in a 1 km .6 miles, radius around Aldgate tube station because key emergency personnel did not have a CULC enabled mobile phones. The communications failures during the emergency sparked discussions to improve London's emergency communications system. For most of the day, central London's public transport system was largely out of service following the complete closure of the underground, the closure of the Zone 1 bus network, and the evacuation of incident sites such as Russell Square. Bus services restarted at 4 p.m. on July 7 and most mainline railway stations resumed service soon afterward. River vessels were pressed into service to provide a free alternative to overcrowded trains and buses. Local lifeboats were required to act as safety boats, including the Sheerness lifeboat from the Isle of Sheppey in Kent. Thousands of people chose to walk home or to the nearest Zone 2 bus or railway station. Most of the underground apart from the stations affected by the bombs, resumed service the next morning, though some commuters chose to stay at home. Affected stretches were also closed for police investigations. Much of the King's Cross railway station was also closed, with the ticket hall and waiting area being used as a makeshift hospital to treat casualties. Although the station reopened later during the day, only suburban rail services were able to use it with Great North Eastern Railway trains terminating at Peterborough, the service was fully restored on July 9. King's Cross St. Pancras tube station remained available only to Metropolitan Line services to facilitate the ongoing recovery and investigation for a week, though Victoria Line services were restored on July 15 and the Northern Line on July 18. All the damaged trains were basically removed in stages. St. Pancras Station, 
located next to King's Cross, was shut on the afternoon of the attacks, with all Midland mainline trains terminating at Leicester, causing disruption to services to Sheffield, Nottingham and Derby. On July 25, the Hammersmith and City line was reopened from Baker Street to Barking after the affected train was cleared at Aldgate, together with the stretch from Moorgate to Aldgate of the Metropolitan Line. The Hammersmith to Paddington part of the Hammersmith and City line was a shuttle service after the bombings. On the July 29, the district line was reopened from High Street Kensington to Edgware Road, after the affected train was cleared. On August 2 the Hammersmith and City line resumed normal service, the Circle line was still suspended, though all Circle line stations are also served by other lines. The Piccadilly line service resumed on August 4 after the affected train was cleared on July 16, and enhanced maintenance work was done. On August 4, Circle line was reopened again. Economic Effect there were limited reactions to the attack in the world economy as measured by financial market and exchange rate activity. The value of the British pound decreased 0.89 cents to a 19-month low against the US dollar. The FTSE 100 index fell by about 200 points during the two hours after the first attack. This was its greatest decrease since the invasion of Iraq, and it triggered the London Stock Exchange's special measures restricting panic selling and aimed at ensuring market stability. By the time the market closed it had recovered to only 71.3 points, 1.36%, down on the previous day's three-year closing high. Markets in France, Germany, the Netherlands and Spain also closed about 1% down on the day. U.S. market indexes increased slightly partly because the dollar index increased sharply against the pound and the euro. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 31.61 to 10,302.29. The Nasdaq Composite Index increased 7.01 to 2075.66. The S&P 500 increased 2.93 points to 1,197.87 after decreasing as much as 1%. Every benchmark value gained 0.3%. The market values increased again on July 8 as it became clear that the damage caused by the bombings was not as great as thought initially. By end of trading the market had recovered fully to above its level at start of trading on July 7. Insurers in the UK tend to reinsure their terrorist liabilities in excess of the first £75 million with Pool Re a mutual insurer established by the government with major insurers. Pool Re has substantial reserves and newspaper reports indicated that claims would easily be funded. On July 9, the Bank of England, Home Treasury and the Financial Services Authority revealed that they had instigated contingency plans immediately after the attacks to ensure that the UK financial markets could keep trading. This involved the activation of a secret chat room on the British government's financial sector continuity website, which allowed the institutions to communicate with the country's banks and market dealers. Media Response Continuous news coverage of the attacks was broadcast throughout July 7, by both BBC One and ITV One, uninterrupted until 7pm Sky News did not broadcast any advertisements for 24 hours. ITN confirmed later that its coverage on ITV1 was its longest uninterrupted on-air broadcast of its 50-year history. Television coverage was notable for the use of mobile telephone footage sent in by members of the public and live pictures from traffic CCTV cameras. The BBC online website recorded an all-time bandwidth peak of 11 GB S at midday on July 7. BBC News received some 1 billion total accesses throughout the course of the day, including all images, text, and HTML, serving some 5.5 terabytes of data. At peak times during the day there were 40,000 page requests per second for the BBC News website. The previous day's announcement of the 2012 Summer Olympics being awarded to London resulted in up to 5 GB s. 
The previous all-time maximum for the website followed the announcement of the Michael Jackson verdict, which used 7.2 GB s On July 12 it was reported that the British National Party released leaflets showing images of the number 30 bus after it was destroyed. The slogan, Maybe now it's time to start listening to the BNP was printed beside the photo. Home Secretary Charles Clark described it as an attempt by the BNP to cynically exploit the current tragic events in London to further their spread of hatred. Some media outside the UK complained that successive British governments had been unduly tolerant towards radical Islamist militants, so long as they were involved in activities outside the UK. Britain's alleged reluctance to extradite or prosecute terrorist suspects resulted in London being dubbed Londoniston by the columnist Melanie Phillips. Claims of Responsibility Even before the identity of the bombers became known, former Metropolitan Police Commissioner Lord Stevens said he believed they were almost certainly born or based in Britain, and would not fit the caricature Al-Qaeda fanatic from some backward village in Algeria or Afghanistan. The attacks would have required extensive preparation and prior reconnaissance efforts, and a familiarity with bomb-making and the London Transport Network as well as access to significant amounts of bomb-making equipment and chemicals. Some newspaper editorials in Iran blamed the bombing on British or American authorities seeking to further justify the war on terror, and claimed that the plan that included the bombings also involved increasing harassment of Muslims in Europe. On August 13, 2005, quoting police and MI5 sources, The Independent reported that the bombers acted independently of an Al-Qaeda terror mastermind someplace abroad. On September 1 it was reported that Al-Qaeda officially claimed responsibility for the attacks in a videotape broadcast by the Arab television network Al Jazeera. However, an official inquiry by the British government reported that the tape claiming responsibility had been edited after the attacks, and that the bombers did not have direct assistance from Al-Qaeda. Zabi UK Tafai, an Al-Qaeda commander arrested in Pakistan in January 2009, may have had connections to the bombings, according to Pakistani intelligence sources. More recently, Documents found by German authorities on a terrorist suspect arrested in Berlin in May 2011 have suggested that Rashid Rauf, a British Al-Qaeda operative, played a key role in planning the attacks. Abu Hafs al-Masri Brigades A second claim of responsibility was posted on the Internet by another Al-Qaeda-linked group, Abu Hafs al-Masri Brigades. The group had, however, previously falsely claimed responsibility for events that were the result of technical problems, such as the 2003 London blackout and the U.S. Northeast blackout of 2003. Conspiracy Theories A survey of 500 British Muslims undertaken by Channel 4 News in 2007 found that 24% believed the four bombers blamed for the attacks did not perform them. In 2006, the government had refused to hold a public inquiry, stating that it would be a ludicrous diversion. Prime Minister Tony Blair said an independent inquiry would undermine support for MI5, while the leader of the opposition, David Cameron, said only a full inquiry would get to the truth. In reaction to revelations about the extent of security service investigations into the bombers prior to the attack, the shadow Home Secretary, David Davis, said, it is becoming more and more clear that the story presented to the public and parliament is at odds with the facts. However, the decision to not hold an independent public inquest was later reversed. A full public inquest into the bombings subsequently began in October 2010. Coroner Lady Justice Hallett said that the inquest would examine how each victim died and whether MI5, if it had worked better, could have prevented the attack. There have been various conspiracy theories proposed about the bombings, including the suggestion that the bombers were patsies, based on claims about timings of the trains and the train from Luton, supposed explosions underneath the carriages, and allegations of the faking of the one-time stamped and dated photograph of the bombers at Luton Station.
Claims made by one theorist in the internet video Seven Seventh's Ripple Effect were examined by the BBC documentary series The Conspiracy Files, in an episode titled Seven Seventh's First Broadcast on June 30, 2009, which debunked many of the video's claims. On the day of the bombings Peter Power of Visor Consultants gave interviews on BBC Radio 5 Live and ITV saying that he was working on a crisis management simulation drill in the city of London, based on simultaneous bombs going off precisely at the railway stations where it happened this morning, when he heard that an attack was going on in real life. He described this as a coincidence. He also gave an interview to the Manchester Evening News where he spoke of an exercise involving mock broadcasts when it happened for real. After a few days he dismissed it as a spooky coincidence on Canadian TV. Investigation Initial Results Initially, there was much confused information from police sources as to the origin, method, and even timings of the explosions. Forensic examiners had thought initially that military-grade plastic explosives were used, and, as the blasts were thought to have been simultaneous, that synchronized timed detonators were employed. This hypothesis changed as more information became available. Homemade organic peroxide-based devices were used, according to a May 2006 report from the British government's Intelligence and Security Committee. The explosive was triacetone triperoxide. Fifty-six people, including the four suicide bombers, were killed by the attacks and about 700 were injured of whom about 100 were hospitalist for at least one night. The incident was the deadliest single act of terrorism in the United Kingdom since the 1988 bombing of Pan Am Flight 103, which crashed on Lockerbie and killed 270 people, and the deadliest bombing in London since the Second World War. Police examined about 2,500 items of CCTV footage and forensic evidence from the scenes of the attacks. The bombs were probably placed on the floors of the trains and bus. Investigators identified four men who they alleged had been the suicide bombers. This made the bombings the first ever suicide attack in the British Isles Nicolas Sarkozy, the interior minister and future president of France, caused consternation at the British Home Office when he briefed the press that one of the names had been described the previous year at an Anglo-French security meeting as an asset of British intelligence. Home Secretary Charles Clark said later that this was not his recollection. Vincent Canestraro, former head of the Central Intelligence Agency's Anti-Terrorism Centre, told The Guardian that two unexploded bombs were recovered as well as mechanical timing devices although this claim was explicitly rejected by London's Metropolitan Police Service. Police Raids West Yorkshire police raided six properties in the Leeds area on July 12, two houses in Beeston, two in Thornhill, one in Holbeck and one in Alexandra Grove in Hyde Park, Leeds. One man was arrested. Officers also raided a residential property on Northern Road in the Buckinghamshire town of Aylesbury on July 13. The police service say a significant amount of explosive material was found in the Leeds raids and a controlled explosion was carried out at one of the properties. Explosives were also found in the vehicle associated with one of the bombers, Shazad Tanweer, at Luton Railway Station and subjected to controlled explosion. Luton Cell there was speculation about a possible association between the bombers and another alleged Islamist cell in Luton which was ended during August 2004. The Luton group was uncovered after Muhammad Naeem Noor Khan was arrested in Lahore, Pakistan. His laptop computer was said to contain plans for two attacks in London, as well as attacks on financial buildings in New York City and Washington, D.C. The group was subject to surveillance but on August 2, 2004 the New York Times published Khan's name, citing Pakistani sources. The news leak forced police in Britain and Canada to make arrests before their investigations were complete. The US government later said they had given the name to some journalists as background information, for which Tom Ridge, 
the United States Secretary of Homeland Security, apologized. When the Luton cell was ended, one of the London bombers, Mohammed Siddiq Khan, no known relation, was scrutinized briefly by MI5 who determined that he was not a likely threat and he was not surveilled. March 2007 Arrests On March 22, 2007, three men were arrested in connection with the bombings. Two were arrested at 1 p.m. at Manchester Airport, attempting to board a flight bound for Pakistan that afternoon. They were apprehended by undercover officers who had been following the men as part of a surveillance operation. They had not intended to arrest the men that day, but believed they could not risk letting the suspects leave the country. A third man was arrested in the Beeston area of Leeds at an Please subscribe and thanks for watching.